<clears throat> All right, so um, let's just begin. Uh, is I hope everyone's there. Uh, for the last time, I think I'll just request uh, for those who have just joined in, uh, please prefix your name with either audit or participate, uh, depending on the options you chose while signing up for the workshop. It'll just be easy for me to communicate. So just a personal request to, I think there are a few, um, Salman Rahman, Soumya Agarwal, Vinod Venkatesan, and Vivek, if you could just uh, prefix yourselves, please. Thank you. And Akshata, the same request, please. <clears throat> okay, um, so, all right, so let me just uh, start by again, welcoming you all for um, introduction to parametric modeling. Let me just start sharing my screen. Uh, okay, so first thing first, um, a little bit of um, response would be great. Uh, this is my first time doing uh, a crossover workshop online and it's kind of strange talking to a wall. Um, so if briefly you could just mute, unmute yourself just to say yes, no, maybe it'll be really helpful. Um, so, first of all, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Awesome. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. Perfect. All right, cool. So, uh, let me just set the, let the, I, I hope everyone's seen the studio structure. So, let me just uh, set the expectations here. This course has been specifically designed uh, for people who, uh, have no idea what Grasshopper is or <clears throat> what's its um, capabilities. Uh, if you have dabbled with Grasshopper a bit, fair enough. Uh, you can just learn the basics. But uh, it is essentially a beginner's course. What I do expect is that uh, we would be able to um, navigate a bit of Rhino. Uh, that's a standard expectation. Uh, it's not, it's, the Rhino is not going to be too extensive, but if you know your way around Rhino is just going to help. So on the onset, it's a beginner's course. Uh, if somebody is joined with a, another expectation of, um, of we teaching, we teaching some intermediate uh, and advanced stuff, uh, not really, but uh, it's, you could, you could revisit your basics. Um, so I sincerely hope uh, that uh, Grasshopper has been, uh, so Rhino has been installed. I'm currently going to be working on Rhino 6.0, uh, which has the Grasshopper inbuilt. If somebody has a previous version, uh, like Rhino 5, you might have to install Grasshopper. Uh, and for Rhino 7, of course, Grasshopper comes inbuilt. Uh, but I haven't migrated to Rhino uh, 7 uh, work in progress yet. So I'm pretty sure it's going to carry everything 6 does. Uh, but the benchmark or the reference point for everyone is uh, going to be Grasshopper. We just need uh, Adobe to basically just collate our data and uh, hopefully put together a presentation. Um, so there are going to be three lectures uh, that have been distributed along the day along the three courses one today just to kick off uh, the um, the thoughts on computational thinking and then we have two invited guests um, tomorrow uh, one in the morning one in the evening which kind of sets up the application of these tools um, so if you have um, seen the structure but then again depends on the um, speed of learning that everyone has. If all good, let's just uh, kick into uh, the computational thinking lecture. If you're all good, if anyone has a specific question before we start, uh, here's the time. Yes, no, maybe? All right. 
Okay. Okay, so the thing about architectural academia, and I say it from the perspective of primarily undergrad education, is that uh, we all get influenced by such imagery which is now extremely accessible um, online. Some of these are uh, amazing built works, but most of them remain in the domain of uh, being digital projects. Uh, my endeavor personally um, is on the side of using tech so that you're able to fabricate and put stuff together. And I, I operate in the realm of the Indian architectural um, industry where there is also an immense uh, labor force. So what I constantly say that my current research endeavors are how do you manage a, like a high tech uh, method of manufacturing or oh, sorry of design with a relatively low or mid-tech method of manufacturing or putting things together on site. Um, coming back, this is all, this is the, all the kind of projects that we see all around us. Some are extensively built. Um, but this, fortunately or unfortunately, these projects get associated with terms like the following, digital associative, algorithmic, et cetera. And we all get fascinated by scripts and codes. What I want to discuss is the concept of computational thinking uh, and not necessarily the, uh, in the early part, at least not the dependency on the use of computers. There are two different things. Currently, um, the pipeline across the world follows this uh, usual format. Uh, and this is all kind of depending on which stage of the, which stage the project is at the kind of software that the world uses. So uh, for example, our Rhino, which we're gonna do today, uh, usually forms in the early part, the early, the concepts in the DD. Of course, now with the, all the plugins uh, that people, people are developing, we're using it extensively into project delivery as well. But this usually is the format for different projects, um, uh, do, do, or different software that are being used at a different stages of the project. However, the world existed and complex shapes existed before uh, any of this happened. So this, for example, is, I hope you've seen, uh, at least online, the Valencia Oceanographic. This is by Felix Candela, uh, very popular uh, architect. This is another uh, chapel. Uh, this, I think, is in Mexico City, again by Candela. Um, and this is about 200 hardworking Mexicans trying to sh solve that shape uh, just by pure understanding of math. This is very early parametric design. This is very early computational design, whatever you may call it, computational thinking. But the methodologies is not the dependency on the scripts and the codes and the software tools that we have at our disposal today. Life has definitely become easier. Uh, but like I said, to solve a, a complex geometry problem, it's not only that you have to know a tool to do it. Of course, we are all familiar with the chain chain models of Antonio Gaudi. Uh, Mark Burry is doing a fantastic session and he can discuss much more in detail beyond, of course, the catenary methods uh, to solve um, the structure uh, for Sagrada Familia. Other, some lesser known uh, people is Heinz Isler. So he used to do these fantastic, very thin shells um, and the methodology he used is like, he used to literally take a handkerchief and put it outside in the cold and by the morning it would freeze in the right position and that would be his working model to solve all compression. And he used a very simple principle that, you know, inverted tension is actually pure compression. Um, we should all also probably be familiar with uh, Otto's uh, soap bubble experiments to get his minimal services. And of course, that resulted in some outstanding structures uh, uh, in at the university in his backyard, and then eventually uh, the Munich Stadium for 1972 uh, Olympics. Um, so the the image on the bottom left, um, this is actually sort of the usage of computers and computational design. So they act they model a scale even where the wires were modeled down to scale. So this is an operative model 
and there were about 64 computers um, each focusing on a on set of nodes which which mapped uh, the structural behavior of each node each cable uh, uh, for for the execution purposes so this is a scaled down version not just as a representation model but an operation model <clears throat> that thankfully has just reduced to few plugins uh, now we have in every laptop um, another fascinating person that uh, I, I really uh, was impressed uh, by is Ilario Dieste. He's a Uruguayan uh, architect, um, structural engineer, and he used to build these amazing vault systems uh, and essentially to do large canopies for gas stations. <clears throat> this one's called the bull, like the bird, uh, but I think this is, this is a tribute to Dieste uh, by some of the um, students there. Another example by the estate, this is uh, called the um, Obrero Church. Um, and here, while the other examples we're looking at, at uh, spanning systems, this was another methodology where the walls uh, work as structural members just by sheer understanding that, you know, if you fold them, their strength uh, increases multifolds. So, these are some built examples just to drive home the point uh, that complex geometry is not necessarily dependent uh, on the digital tools. Uh, it's just a, it's a method of thinking and how intense the research would be. So not so many built examples, but the two images that I have here, one on the left is um, actually uh, OMA's uh, Remco Loss's proposal for Park Villa Viet. Uh, Park Villa Viet, uh, Park in France is, is popular for Shumi's design and reconstructivism. Um, but little people know that OMA was, a, it was in fact a close second. Uh, there is also speculation that he won the award, but that, that's just uh, nice architectural gossip. Uh, what they did was they set up the park in a layers of um, um, layers of information where the final product is dependent on uh, the engagement of the people who visit. So in principle, what computation, computational design is at today is you set up the rules for the eventual form to arrive at. Um, so it's very interesting and maybe uh, Pakti Raviyat by OMA is not usually discussed in that reference point of computational design, but it was a very early example of urban design level computational thinking. On the right hand side is uh, some sketches by Otto. Uh, he was trying to solve um, um, city planning uh, on a very regular grid pattern. And if you notice the top right, it's very similar to these attract attractor based parametric models that uh, we all see today uh, that's readily available. By the way, we're going to do one of those um, scripts. At every level, we are all aware. Um, so what's happening computationally? And the best example that I usually give to um, uh, friends and students is you know, the example of an arch. The unit is the same. The rule of aggregation changes. So if you change the, if you change the um, rule, if you change the rule, the, the final profile changes completely, right? But the original component is always the same. Um, another thing that fascinates us is, of course, the geometric patterns that are hidden in a, any um, Mughal or Islamic style, uh, be it the spanning system, the domes or the jalis that exist. Um, and this is, again, very close to heart. Just, uh, just bear, bear with me and watch this video. Okay, so these are, um, sorry, the voice is of course not available. So these are weavers in Kashmir. They're the carpet weavers in Kashmir. And what you saw there, uh, this, um, where'd go? Yeah. This script is actually a code. They, uh, the designer writes the pattern 
in a weaving script and they are just supposed to theoretically just follow this code theoretically they are not aware what the final outcome is they are just dependent on this code so this is very early and this has been going on for centuries uh, and this is a very early example of again uh interpreting a script um to give design a particular shape so this is one of my really beautiful examples and what comes out of it if you see what comes out of it is absolutely outstanding and it's unbelievable that they never know what the final pattern is and all they have to do is follow uh, the other instructions okay moving on so what is computation thinking um one thing i would say that computation exists all around uh and it is how you just if you're willing to view it so um is anyone so i'm sure you're aware what this is this is um a wing of a dragonfly <clears throat> very so what's happening is that the span the cantilever uh is getting measured currently on the forces that are acting on the span so uh the redder it is the stiffer um uh, it is and hence what you see is is the uh, the structural support system is also thicker and it's laden by by this pattern which is called the voronoi pattern and i encourage people to look into it you will find it in every skin um that's there we also have a voronoi pattern underneath our top layer and this is a uh, of course uh, um um a microscopic vision of uh, ice uh, as it's falling down and uh, i'm pretty sure you guys are aware but every um water vapor that turns into a snowflake or an ice crystal uh is different and the reason for that is that even though they're falling together next to each other but that microscopic difference of probably microns uh changes the internal and the external pressure as the kind of wind atmospheric pressure that falls that uh, that acts on each of these snowflakes causes them to change um another example of course is a soap bubble and why it maintains its shape and the primary reason is that the again the atmospheric pressure that's outside and the internal pressure as long as they balance it will maintain its shape uh, <clears throat> one of my again favorite videos um so where you see computation is totally dependent on the lens you view it from so this is a flock of uh, sterlings and would you believe that there is computation here as well not that little massive bird on the side but these guys so where you see computation here is not in the global form but you see at the at a unit level they are actually following four rules um, the first rule is avoid uh, move away if you're too close the other rule that they're following is uh, copy uh, which is you fly in the general direction of your neighbor or of the flock you center uh, that means you don't expose yourself too much you don't get out too much and the other is move view um so just move laterally away from your neighbor so <clears throat> these are just the four four principles that cause this beautiful symphony so what does it mean computational thinking it's essentially an extension of our intellect it's just a method of how you approach a problem so to to i understand the human for example we could do three things we could dissect it and a lot of people would say that okay if you have two eyes ears arms legs a torso a nose you can identify a human right so that's one way to identify another way to identify is the global you know global pattern homo erectus to homo sapiens uh from where we heading so there's a global understanding of uh, humans as a race and the third is how we interact with each other we can communicate i can talk to you you can understand uh english you can see me 
hand gestures and so on and so forth. That's another way to in, under, understand a human. But so here's the thing. The thing is that if the human is a product, uh, it can be broken down into different objective layers of understanding. Computation thinking is essentially that: is how do you break a subjective information into objective uh, dialogue? So, uh, if, for example, if I zoom, come in closer, you're uncomfortable. If I move back, you can see what I'm doing. The distance between the camera, somewhere here, notionally, you're aware that this is a comfort position. Maybe the lighting is really bad, but this is a comfort position where you can see me. If you're able to code it, say, 18 inches from the camera screen, you're able to reduce. It's a subjective argument of I was comfortable when I was comfortable when Abhishek was 18 inches away from the laptop screen. That's all there is to the understanding of object, uh, subjective to objective. Um, so how do you implement? Now we're getting into so this is this this has been a beautiful little theory. So how do we implement? Uh, any com any computation um, just broadly operates on these five principles. There's always an input um, and of course an output. What do you do with the input and output? So there's a math, you add them, you multiply, you divide, you subtract. Um, and then there's a condition and condition is only add when it's above five, only divide when it's not zero and stuff like that. So you do simple things first and then you repeat to add complexity. Now the repetition could be at, at like input output level, it could be a combination or it could be the complete function as is. So again, just to just to repeat myself, uh, what you do for any computation <clears throat> is uh, you take very simple steps. You try and break it out into the five principles of input, output, math, condition, and repetition, and you add complexity by the repetition. And what is a parametric model? Uh, very simply put, uh, this is just a quick sketch. If you're, you're designing a table, um, it would be probably four feet by two feet or 1200 by 600 by 750 high. However, if I parametricize it, this is how you would read it. So if you've set up something that's called, you know, a dependency or a relationship, that's all there is. Parametrically link one aspect of design to the other aspect of design and you take up, you take out uh, absoluteness from it. Okay, so that's a bit of um, theory. Uh, we, we're done with computational thinking. Uh, we can jump into Grasshopper. Um, if there are any conversation thoughts, uh, we can just spend five minutes on this before we move further. So on to you guys. Does it need a good math? Does it need good math? Um, it's so as far as um, as architects are concerned, we cannot hide from math at all. Uh, we need to. We, so let me put it this way: you, yes, you need an understanding of math, uh, but the understanding of math is totally dependent on what you're trying to achieve. So if suppose you are dabbling completely in three D geometry. So we need to understand what a Cartesian system is. We need to understand, you know, what a zero comma zero comma twelve means. And uh, but uh, you need not know, like the not necessarily you need not know that the equation for a circle is, you know, x square plus y square equal to r square. So that that's where the software comes in. But understanding of math usually helps. Uh, thankfully, at a at a simple Google search, you can you can find any math equation um, to help to come at your service. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, anything else? This is just primarily principles of computational thinking. So I always try and uh, drive home a point to all the students and because a lot of undergrad students get influenced by parametric design uh, and the words that get associated that 
uh, while there is a lust for all this uh, imagery and the kind of forms that you're able to achieve. Um, however, you know, it's how you think is important and not, not uh, necessarily the script. And if you're able to think right, you'll be able to script better. Okay, I guess uh, uh, there is none. Uh, so I'll just uh, move further. Um, <clears throat> grasshopper history and interface. So I was lucky to be uh, in a position where, where I was one of the earliest users of Grasshopper when it got introduced back in 2007. <clears throat> a lot of uh, a lot of architects were relying on uh, textual coding, uh, like RhinoScript um, or C Sharp. Uh, a lot of uh, C, C Sharp, a lot of other things. When Grasshopper came in in 2007, and it's changed completely how we program. Uh, it's Grasshopper is it's called a VPL. It's a Visual Programming Language. Uh, it was designed by um, David Rutten. And uh, it's, it started off with an essential alternate to RhinoScript. It was a plugin built specifically for Rhino, uh, which is currently also the dominant factor. And I discovered this reply very interesting from David Redden himself, where he quotes the origins of, uh, of uh, Grasshopper. So it's just a little trivia here. Feel free to read it. Uh, it was called Explicit History at one point of time. Uh, it was explicit history was a categoric function within Rhino. Uh, but yeah, it's come leaps and bounds and it's become the high household dependency for um, any, any designer currently, jewelry designer, automobile designer, architects, structural designers. It's just got to become a go-to software. So if you just want to, uh, I'll just... If you just want to open Gra Rhino, let's do this. If you sh start your Rhino, and once you start your Rhino, start, Rhino will probably, okay, let me start my Rhino as well. So, if you're new to Rhino, uh, it'll prompt you to choose uh, large objects, small objects, and uh, small objects and uh, unit system. Uh, it doesn't matter, but just for convenience, you could just stick to large objects and meters. Um, again, I hope everyone can navigate Rhino, but it's like a, almost every other um, a 3D software. The good thing for AutoCAD users or CAD users to jump to Rhino is the fact that it is also command-based system and something that we're used to. A lot of commands are very similar to AutoCAD commands. Uh, although it does have a nice GUI and you can you know, click and drag and do stuff. However, what we need to do is go to the command prompt. Uh, if you are running on you know, a default Rhino, your screen should look very similar to mine. It will be different on a Mac user. Mac user, you might have your command either tucked in in a left toolbar or bottom of the screen. Uh, again, I'm not gonna dabble too much into Mac dependency, I apologize. Um, this is configured, this workshop is primarily configured for window users, but I don't think you should have much problems. Okay, so go to the command prompt and type grasshopper. Depending on how many plugins you <clears throat> have, uh, Grasshopper is going to take time. So let's just run through the basics of Grasshopper. Grasshopper essentially creates an imagery of geometry in your Rhino window. Okay. So I'll get to that uh, in a bit. Let's understand the interface first. So, okay. There are essentially four components to any Grasshopper pane. This is called the menu bar, and uh, like any, like any, um, like any menu bar, this of course has um, open file has your new document, open document, and so on and so forth. Uh, edit is obviously a cut, copy, paste. View, uh, we'll get into it as we go along. Um, 
Display is a method of displaying steps, different components. Uh, you will discover this um, sooner. Solution um, is nothing is activated because we have nothing on the canvas path. Uh, you will see this activated as well. And help is something that I want to uh, discuss. I heavily rely on Grasshopper support. So if you go to um, Grasshopper, this will take you to the Grasshopper forum. And it's an extensively useful place to be because all your queries um, usually get answered here. Um, they also have other, uh, other forums, uh, Rhino 3D and uh, Food for Rhino where you can get new tools. But join in a discussion, contribute, learn, because probably I'm pretty sure if you're starting out, a lot of your conversations would be available here. So this is something that I highly recommend. And it's very easy to access. It's right here, help and grasshopper. OK, so the next uh, part is, <coughs> excuse me, is the competence bar. Now, this is where Rhino differs. Um, and a component bar, so I'll just run through this. The components bar this is called the canvas bar, and this is the canvas where all, all the craziness happens, right? So let's just, uh, so I don't have to come back to anything here. Yeah, this has been covered. All right, cool. So menu bar, components bar, canvas bar, and the canvas. Okay, so what, what are these things? So if you look at it, I'm just going to increase Grasshopper, maximize Grasshopper. If you look at your Grasshopper, you're probably going to have it till transform or uh, display. You won't have any of these, but that's fine. If you've installed uh, your lunchbox um, and your paneling tools, that you, they might appear here. But your default Grasshopper is going to be up till display. So not to worry. What Grasshopper has done is it has broken down your inputs into different categories. So uh, if you want to work on curves, then you go to curves. If you want to work on surfaces, you work on surfaces. Points lie in the vector. Uh, sets is something we're going to discover uh, very soon. It's how uh, Rhino stores information. And if people are used to um, uh, programming languages, it is just a data storing methodology. Uh, intersect genuinely means intersect. It's like physical, um, you know, uh, well, intersection. Uh, and transform means your move, rotate, uh, scale, uh, stuff like that. So this is where all the magic happens. This, so we can try simple Excel, go to uh, parameters or patterns. And you can drag and drop a component onto the canvas bar. So this entire thing is called the canvas bar. We could just simply go, we pick up a component, drag it here. So this one is called, um, you zoom in with your, with your scroll, middle button scroll. Left click and drag helps you select. And like Rhino, you have to, uh, cover the entire component for a for a complete selection, or if you go the other way, if you go bottom right to top left, you just have to touch the component. It's same as CAD, I guess, and same as uh, Rhino. So you scroll in with your middle mouse, you select with your left, and you pan with your right click. So just get comfortable comfortable with that, please. Okay. Um, you select a component and you can hit delete to delete it. If I want to get this, so this is called a point, right? If you can read the orange um, tag there, it says point. So if you want to get this point uh, without going to the component bar, what you could simply do is you could double tap, double click, sorry, onto the canvas bar and start typing. And again, Grasshopper also has its own command, um, command prompt. And there you find that point again. So there are two ways of retrieving a component, uh, drag, and, drag and drop, and typing. So what you'll notice here, I'm just reducing uh, grasshopper. 
Five, just a second. That it's popping up, it's showing orange and it's popping up an error. Uh, floating point parameter uh, failed to collect data. So this is now just getting into interface. This is now another um, stuff we're going to go, in, go into is how do you navigate yourself around Grasshopper? Right click, right click on the point on the component and say select one point. It'll take you to Rhino. Just click anywhere in say your top viewport. And now, by default, it might be green. And if you click away on the campus, it is uh, canvas. It is gray. Right. So let's do that again. Control Z. You right click. You say set one point. It'll take you to Rhino straight, and you just click in in Rhino somewhere, and it'll turn green. It'll turn green. Now while this guy is still orange, so what does it mean? This just simply means that this guy, this uh, component has information in it, while this has no information or data in it. Right? Simple. Uh, another thing you do is you also realize I'm just gonna so I'm just gonna copy this so which is click it, control C, control V. Oops, control C, control V. It'll make a copy. So the difference between these two is when you when you select the component, it'll turn green, and it'll also point to where it'll also point to your uh, Rhino canvas, uh, the selection. Um, okay. A few things. If you're not able to see the gumball, this is called the gumball, uh, the X Y axis. What you need to do is on Grasshopper. Uh, go to display and turn gumballs on. So it should be pressed. If it's unpressed, you won't see the gumball. If it's pressed, you'll see the gumball. Okay. <clears throat> now, I'm just going to. So the advantage of uh, gumball is I can, in Rhino, I can move this comp, uh, the um, input around. So now I have two points one is this, one is that. Okay. Another quick thing to learn is right click again and turn preview off. So you don't see that uh, uh, element anymore, right? So simple, right click, turn it on, turn it off. Turn it on, turn it off. Another method is you select it and you middle click and you'll have this nice little handy shortcut, which, I, which you're gonna use extensively. So middle and hold, middle button and hold, and you can turn it on and off from here. OK. <clears throat> I'm going to copy this again. Control C, Control V. This is the same point, but I want different points. So I'll just go on Rhino. I'll drag it out. This is the advantage of Gumball. You can just drag it out. So you'll realize that you cannot select these in Rhino because they don't exist in Rhino. They are, like I said, a mirror images that Grasshopper is creating. While you, if you click a point from Rhino, so you click a point here and put it on Rhino, this is something you can select and you can move it around. Right? So this is a, this is information that is available in Rhino. This is the information that's available in Grasshopper. In reality, Rhino's reality, these these three points do not exist as of now. Only this point exists. Okay. Uh, what you could do also is now let's right click. So I hope you everyone's created a point in Rhino. So either you type point or you click a point and drag and just place it anywhere in Rhino. Just place it anywhere in the top view. Okay. Another way to feed information to Grasshopper is by going on to Grasshopper again, right clicking, set one point, and you select the point you've created in Rhino. Now, Rhino and Grasshopper are linked to the information that Rhino had. Okay. So this point clearly exists in Rhino and it exists in, in Grasshopper. 
you can move it around in both ends. Okay, I'm gonna delete it for now. So this is empty. So we, okay. Coming back to how it looks. <clears throat> so we've worked with preview on and preview off. Another thing we're gonna do is now select this point and you can enable and disable. So this is called enable, this is called disable. The difference between pre uh, preview on and off and enable disable is that an enable disable stops Grasshopper from computing. For it, this component does not say the information does not exist. Here, the information exists, it's just the fact you chose not to see it, right? Um, so I hope that's clear, difference between preview on and off and enable disable. Okay, moving on. This still doesn't have the information. Another method use, another problem that you'll see in uh, Grasshopper is, uh just follow me, just uh, bear with me a second so i draw a curve in rhino i say a curve in grasshopper right click set one curve give that information so how do i do that again you can go to curve uh, sorry uh, pa parameters and curve right or you can double click and say curve right click set one curve and you can select this curve. So right click, set one curve and there we go. <clears throat> Try doing this and the next step you do, uh, what you do is that take your, uh, take your output of the curve and feed it into the point. So this is your input on the left side is always inputs of the component on the right side is the outputs of the component. So you pull it out, drag with your mouse left click and put it into uh, the point component. Now it suddenly turned red. That clearly means that the wrong input has been given. It wasn't expecting this input. It's not designed for this input. And of course it's right because you're feeding a point component a curve. So it will never be able to understand. So these are essentially uh, the methodologies. Uh, this, these are essentially the, you know, four, four, um, one, two, three, four, five ways in which you'll see uh, your components ever. If information is ready, it'll be like this. If there is no data, it'll be orange. Once you select any of these, it'll turn green. It might be disabled, uh, so it'll turn dark gray. If the wrong information is there, it'll turn red. So all your components across Rhino uh, will show these five uh, characters five colors. Okay, another another idea of uh, understanding the canvas is something that's called a widget. And widget are essentially sh shortcuts and cues that are available and it's like a widget everywhere. It's like a widget on your phone or a widget on Google or whatever. So uh, the primary important two widgets that I always, always use uh, is this is called the compass. And you can see them in display. Uh, it's the compass. Uh, the aligner, aligner is, I want to align these guys. Once you select two or more components, it'll show alignment. So you can, you know, uh, like the name suggests, any other software, you can align left, align right, distribute, vertical, diffuse, fluid, horizontal. Uh, and then one thing I use uh, quite often is the is a, a Markov. Markov is this little uh, segment here. It is extremely useful. It kind of suggests the next uh, component that might be useful to use after these. So this is just based on a good practice. It also learns from how you code uh, and it suggests what you should be doing next. So instead of hunting from, you know, the gamut of parameters here, I'll just prompt you that why don't you take a look at, uh, at this. Um, I hope you're all good. Uh, any questions here? Because now the learning curve is going to be extremely, extremely steep. Uh, we're going to move uh, very quickly. Um, so I hope we're, we're comfortable with the basics. Um, yes. Can I get a quick yes from at least few? Yes, sir. Yes. All right. Sir. Awesome. Any questions? No. Oh, sir, I right. 
actually view the uh, bar which is on the left corner in the grasshopper window bar on the left corner what do you mean like the one which you told suggest the uh, tools i can't that in my oh, this one this one it's yeah so go to display canvas widgets and turn on markov so in your canvas widgets just uh, play with these to see which one is on and off okay um all right uh, moving sir, ahead sir can you hear me yeah i can uh so what's the use of uh, profiler in the canvas widgets i will we'll touch upon it as we go along i didn't want to touch upon it at that point in time oh fine fine then it will be really yeah. good if you can change the battery to full length rather than being an icon in the grasshopper all right sure there you go can you oh, thank you so much yeah okay so what we know pointed out is there's another way to see it i prefer usually working with icons but i think this is a good idea if i if you could toggle back and forth it might be helpful to understand however i highly encourage that uh, you you know the primary format of of, of working in grasshopper is icons so uh, the sooner you get used to the icons it will be really helpful uh, once you're you know going to different resources and uh, downloading the scripts and stuff like that okay um next thing next thing what we're going to do is if this is clear i'm just going to delete this uh so start a new document all right uh, i don't know how many i have here no start a new document and something we're going to learn now is called is a very important part of grasshopper which is oops what's happening here It's called data matching. And how do you, uh, how does Grasshopper use its data? How does Grasshopper um, store its data? Uh, this is the foundation of being able to code in Grasshopper because you're not, if you're not able to fetch um, data, um, it's going to be extremely difficult. Um, okay, so let me just uh, demonstrate. You can take a take a look. uh and if you can follow me it will be fantastic okay so on your rhino just stay, say line and draw two lines on your rhino just draw two lines okay on your grasshopper now double click and say curve and you want the same thing again so control c control v and assign assign a value to this curve right click set one curve take the left one right click set one curve take the right one okay so we've got two curves now set in so this corresponds to that this corresponds to this you can easily uh, just hide it in rhino so what i went i just went in rhino and hid it i don't want to see those curves so i have two curves input it what i'm going to do is i'm going to type divide curve okay which you can find in curve tab uh, as well and here in division you will be able to find divide curve there it is you can drag and drop it or you can just type divide curve uh so take the take the output of the curve and let okay let's see what's written here it says hover over c and it says curve curve to divide it says number of segments and it says kinks right so for c it's very obvious it's saying okay give me feed me an input which is a curve so either i can drag from the output and put it in the input or i can drag from the uh, here the input and put in the output both methodologies work so if you notice some points appear on uh, on your uh, on your rhino top view or any view actually depending on view port you're on i am currently working on top view so i've divided the curve and the division appears here okay uh, another so what i'll also do now is double click and say uh, point list this component point list okay 
Similarly, just hover and see what it's providing. It's providing points. This guy is looking for points. It wants points. It's ready to give points. So the obvious one is just feed it. But you don't see anything. If you zoom in, oh, you hardly see anything. Anyway, never mind. So what we'll do is this competence is scale. So basically, what's happening? It's showing the point numbers. This pointless shows points num point numbers. However. Uh, you're not able to see it. So there is suddenly a scale problem. So I'm just going to try 0.75. And so there we go. Now, how do I get this? This is called a number slider. Uh, it will be available in your uh, um, patterns as well. But the best way is double click and type any number. Okay. So you can type an integer. Uh, and again, just going to math uh, 101, an integer is, of course, 1, 2, 3, 4. It does not have any decimal value. Or you can type a decimal value, which is uh, what programming language, language is called is a float point. So you could type 2, and or you could type 0.22 or 0.25 or whatever you want to type. <clears throat> what happens here is, if you scroll up and down, Dino by default sets the minimum limit and the upper limit. So when I type two, it sets the limit between zero and one. If I type 0.22, it sets the limit between zero and one. This is how just by default, the slider uh, Rhino sets it up. You can change it and I'm going to show you how. So how it works is the your common practice is usually people feed in zero to one or one to 10 or 10 to hundred. So if I say anything above hundred, let's say 12, it's going to set my slider from zero till hundred. So it just reads the next <clears throat> bound limit. Okay. I want to change it. I currently, although 0.22 is giving me a decent output. So if you notice, if I toggle the slider back and forth, toggle the slider back and forth, the numbers increase and decrease. These are just annotations uh, of each point. <clears throat> uh, this changes. However, if I want to divide the number into, uh, sorry, the divide the curve into larger divisions. And I say, I want to divide it into 12 divisions. I type 12, I drag the output into the input and I get 12 divisions, right? Okay. Assuming I did this, assuming I took 0.16, and fed it into the number of divisions. Of course, there is an error. Uh, <clears throat> while the component wanted a number, it wanted a number, you fed it a number, but there is no 0.16 division to a line. <clears throat> it understands integers. So if you account for such a problem, all you do for a number slider is you double click on the name, this is where it says uh, floating point or integer numbers. I would change it to integers and I set the max value. I can double click and type the max value, say 50. Hit OK. And now I have a integer number slider. Same for this. Uh, you can double click and change the format. Uh, totally depends on what you're looking for. So. I have divided this uh, list down and I have, I want, I want to have divided this the curve down. I want to divide this curve further. So all I have to do is select these two, control C, control V. And now the input I want to give to this guy is from this curve division. So I drag this here. Now this is divided as well. Assuming now, I, the scale of the numbers I want to keep the same throughout, right? So there's no point of using two sliders. So all I can do simply is drag it out and put it into the scale there as well and delete this. So this is a, just a quick trick that you can use the same uh, input for multiple places. I can actually use this as well, but doesn't make sense. So uh, an input can go into multiple outputs. Right. I hope uh, everyone's just on page with this. Um, so 
So just bear with me. Okay. So what we're going to do, uh, what you're going to understand is how Rhino stores data. So go to your params and in your input, just below the number slider, which we've used extensively already, there is a little note, uh, like a sticky note, and it says panel. Just drag drop that onto the pane and drag it once again. And take out your points and, and put it into the input of panel. You can adjust the size the way you want. OK. What you're getting here, if you notice, is a list of points. We have 10 points because it says 10 here. Uh, and if you increase, the number of points will increase. I'm going to keep it to 10. <clears throat> but I, what I want you to focus on is this little information that's within the curly brackets. It's called zero comma zero, uh, zero colon, semicolon zero. Right? So just, just key stick to stick to this idea that you notice the um, zero colon, semicolon zero in both the segments. <clears throat> um, I'll just come to that briefly. Now, I want to divide, I want say what, I, what we want to do is we want to join this zero to this zero. You double Sir, can you please explain you... us? Uh, okay. What I'm, what I'm, did you get the, I hope everyone got the panel. It's right here. Panel, you drag and drop the panel uh, onto the canvas and you take out from points and put it into the panel. What you'll see is there are 10, it shows you that there are 10 points. If you hover over it, it says panel with custom values and the values are here. These are the following, uh, 11 locally defined values and 10 divisions. Uh, what, Rhino, what Rhino does is start storing from number zero. Uh, zero, one, two, three, four, up till 10. That means there are 11 values. So it's a very simple thing. You want to divide anything by uh, two. So you'll have three points, right? Yes. Well, right, so what you focus on, however, is this little thing. It's called zero semicolon zero. Uh -huh. Okay, this is what we want to delve into. Zero semicolon zero. <clears throat> Both the lists have the same annotation. Zero semicolon zero. Okay. What I want to do is, and then uh, other than that, then you also have the zero to 10. The zero to 10 is clear to understand the zero to 10 corresponds to this zero to 10. So this little point at minus 5.07, blah, 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 is the address of this guy. This is the address of this guy and so on and so forth, right? And they all have um, last zeros because the Z direction is zero. Uh, this is like a simple Cartesian geometry, right? You have to find a point in a Cartesian grid, X, Y, Z, you give it points and get your location. Now what I want to do is I want to join every zero to every other zero of of this uh, of these two lines. So what I do is I simply double click on the canvas and say line. Sorry, line, and you'll notice a couple of options. We want to choose this: create a line between two points. So the good thing again about Grasshopper, it prompts you every time that what you want to do. Uh, so you just click here is A and B. So you hover. It's looking for a start line, start point. I drag it from here. It's looking for a, and the second one is similar. Uh, it needs another point, end point. I drag it from here and there we go. Whoa. Whoa, magical. <laughs> so, uh, so it just joined all the lines together. Now what's happening? Now coming back to a bit of theory. Okay. So it's not happening in mine. Uh, neither in mine. Uh, are you following this exactly? Curve divide. 
ஒர்க் <laughs> and currently you can just follow right uh, i have all these scripts as an asset and i'll will mail mail them out to to you guys uh, uh can you hello yeah uh, can you repeat what is that ln uh, function it's a line man it's a line so if you just type line okay so line and you have this line make sure you there are two three lines so you hover over the component which says create a line between two points this is is it requires an input of a line so it's very simple you want this line okay create between two lines and it will now to make a line you need two points and like anywhere the is simple like point point and turns into a line and then you have multiple points and it turns into a surface right so ln is actually a line it needs two points it means input from the first point and it needs input from the second point and you will create these bunch of lines um in my uh, rhino like uh, while joining the two lines like how you've got in a parallel thing everywhere like 10 points 10 points like last three points have been um, like they connect okay. one point yeah that's okay so that's that's what i was coming to uh just make sure you have the same slider in both oh okay yeah got it that was my mistake yeah okay just either delete the slider or make sure the same slider goes in both because what you're doing is the number of point number of divisions in one curve was probably higher or lower than the other yes got it thank you all right so yeah just like i said just copy copy this to the t otherwise uh, you can refer to um, the scripts that are the definitions that i will share uh, uh, after after the session okay um so we gonna pick up some even more speed okay um let's understand what's happening in what's happening in rhino so so how rhino stores information is that it always starts it's called the tree branching method it always starts with a trunk uh, as you would imagine which is called data 0 you know um so you know uh like neo the one okay it is the one every data starts with a default value of 0 as soon as you start dividing data it goes it starts a system called the branching system so you want to locate anything on this branch what it means is that okay the trunk is zero and the trunk's branch number zero the next branch would be the trunk is zero which is the leftmost and its first branch and and it goes on so the second branch again is trunk is zero and the branch is called 2 so when you read something that's called 04 you know that there is one major body of data and it has got five divisions uh right because data is stored starting with 0 always 0 1 2 3 4 5 5 that's how data gets uh, stored it starts with a 0 understood that concept is clear if you divide now this branch further it's the same it will always it will always uh, refer back to the earlier generation so i mean uh, just an indian example this is how you know tamil brahmins name kids the fa- the father is the names precedes the child's name and the grandfather and the and the and the gaon and and gotra and everything so this is 
I'm sorry, but that, that's the best example that I can give is that you precede the name uh, of the origin. So this branch now again, this 000, zero, zero means I belong to zero trunk. I belong, I belong to one and my branch is zero. Okay. So if you notice the difference between this guy and this guy is that it belongs to a zero, zero before it. That means a zero trunk, zero branch. And this guy belongs to zero trunk first branch. That's how Grasshopper stores data. So every time you read these zero semicolon zero, 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 that means the number of branches that exist to store data. Okay. Okay. Let me just run through this uh, stupid analogy that I have. Imagine you have like a cupboard. Okay. And you have to retrieve something that's inside this box. Uh, a simple methodology for us would be, uh, dude, it's in the third row and the fourth column. And it's the box on the top, right? That's the simple information that you'll give to retrieve data. Right. I get me my watch from the cupboard. Where is it? Third row, fourth column, top uh, right box. How Rhino understands it is Rhino says, okay, my cupboard is zero because I always start with one. My, and then there are branches. So I don't understand rows and columns yet. I understand branches. So what you've done is you've divided my storage into four branches. 0, 0 branch, 0, 1 branch, 0, 2 branch, 0, 3 branch, 0, 4 branch. And in that, these guys, the cubby holes are actually indices. Indices that they have a number. So this cubby hole belongs to the first branch. So 0, 0 and at index number 2. So you, it's the same principle, just you keep on diving in further. So now this, um, this segment belongs to zero two branch. So I have to get to here, right? I have to get to here. So this is zero two, fine. This is zero two's zero. This is zero two's, let me just, uh, where is annotate? Annotate. This is zero two zero. This is zero two one. This is zero two two. This is zero two three, and this is zero two four. Understood? Zero one two <coughs> three and four. Every time it's going to be the same. Uh, clear all runs. Right. So if you move ahead, what's happening? <clears throat> if you move ahead, that's exactly what I said. Zero two is this branch's name. We're in that third box, right? And what, how I've numbered them is this is zero. This is one, this is two, this is three. Okay. <clears throat> and it goes on forever. So similarly, if that box has further divisions, uh, you know what to do. So that indices becomes a branch further and so on and so forth. So the principle remains the same. It just repeats and becomes another segment that get, keeps on getting added. So your number of um, <clears throat> number of digits uh, just keep on getting added into the curly bracket. Um, let's if you have queries, let's just spend spend it now because this is extremely important for any Rhino exercise. Uh, anyone has doubts on this? So yeah. does this also correspond to the X, Y, Z axis? No, it? it's got nothing to do with the X, Y, Z. Okay. It's absolutely got nothing to do with X, Y, Z. So, um, so actually a very good question. So what's happening? Let me just jump back to Rhino. Uh, Okay, 
so while okay let's now if you, now i'll try and answer that point number 2 here uh point number 2 where is annotate annotate yeah so this guy has this location in xyz this is how we understand storage of data okay this is the precise that let's call it you know that's its name uh, this is where uh, point 2 is uh, that's what point 2 is called uh, point minus 5 4 uh, and comma 0 that's a cartesian location how rhino understand this okay minus 5 4 and 0 lives where it lives at 0 semicolon 0 at position 2 so that becomes the address it rhino does not care what's at the address it could be a point it would curve it could be a watch it could be house it could be whatever rhino does not care what the uh, contents of the address is this is the, the uh, it only understands where it is is that does that help yeah okay yeah okay uh where were we so so this thing is uh, i hope there is a better understanding of how uh, data is being stored you always start with a zero so this line is also zero this line is also zero uh and um, uh it has further divisions which are stored in this branch and those division names are 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 okay uh now something that uh, one of you asked what if i have a situation where the number of divisions are not same what if i have this situation so one line has let's just ease it out one line has five divisions and one line has 12 divisions uh so this is the information that you didn't need like and you don't know what to do with these numbers extra numbers what rhino has done here by default is called the long list that means it will compute till the longer list is over so once it's done computing the shorter list it say all right i'll go on i'll use the last number that was available uh from the short short list guy but i will continue to add it till the long list exists okay so for that principle now i'll just move this line out a little move this line out and let's say we type longest list here you should be able to find it under sets as well sets and then you'll have long list uh, here somewhere yeah long list so uh, pull a long list in put a short list in and put a cross reference in put all of these in align put it here so someone asked me i think vinod asked me that what is an overview uh, i think profiler so you notice these numbers that just vanished if you turn on the profiler it will show you how much time each of these um, each of these components is taken to compute so it really helps when your script becomes uh, really heavy uh, the good practice is that the that the components are taking a lot of time to compute so you have a very complicated surface and you multiplying it several times that will take a longer time to compute so we keep it in disabled mode till we need it so that's what uh, display canvas profiler does okay coming back what i'm going to do, what we're going to do is take the point out here put it in the long list a take the points out from here and put it in the long list b and now make a line you'll get the same out what you have currently okay i'll do the same exercise but this time we use the short list use the short list uh just for everyone's uh, this thing very reference it's in sets and go down it's long list short list cross reference these three areas 
okay pull it out of points again here pull it out of points here again and now once you plug this in you notice a difference so now you've instructed rhino to compute uh, grasshopper to compute only till the short list is available and ignore once the list continues as lo as long as you know uh, you're able to compute till the short list right try the same exercise with long list and as uh, so and with the cross reference and cross reference as you as you would probably guess it it says i will join everything to everything so the first point is joined to the other side 12 times the second guy is joined 12 times and so on so so you get this neck mesh kind of stuff right so just this in importance of short list and long list i'll zoom in for a few seconds so you guys can see what's happening Uh, and just ensure that your scripts are the same. Okay. Hope this is clear. So this is something called data matching. So what you're doing is you're matching the data of the first input with the data of the second input, and how you match it is these three methodologies: long list, short list, cross list. Any doubts here? All right. I'm just going to select everything and turn the preview off. So that again, just to remind everyone, select from top, top left, bottom right. If you can uh, select everything. middle click and you know the blind man turn it off okay um now what's the use of this uh, of this cross reference um, now you, let's could yeah. you please repeat the points part i got a bit confused what part the short and the long part i don't understand um so okay let's turn this back on So you see, notice the curves. This one is divided into five divisions, and this is divided into twelve divisions, right? So by default, this is a shorter list than this. And if you want to do anything with it, anything with these two lists, you have to acknowledge the fact that the lengths lengths of the lists are different. And a list is basically, you know, a, a list of information. So this is a list. This is uh, this is a list of Five points is a list of, sorry, this is a list of six points. This is a list of thirteen points. Okay, it's always going to be the so why? So again, just to repeat, the Rhino starts storing at zero. So if you ever read a twelve, that means twelve plus one. That means zero has to be included. So uh, when you want to operate with lists, there are three methodologies. Either you can be loyal to the longest list. you are loyal to the longest list that means once the short list stops computing you still continue to the long list does not end or you can compute with a short list is as soon as you hit the shortest list stop computing or there's something called cross reference where you compute everything so this guy this is the zero is joined to 12 points on the other side and repeats itself for all the other ones helps Uh, so everyone's going to get these like i said these scripts i'll share with you after uh, every day i'll share the uh, scripts of the day uh, with everyone okay so i'm just going to select all middle click and turn the preview off and we're going to do a small another exercise uh let me just introduce you to another component uh, it should be in math uh or is it in Doing set, it's called or double click. Sorry, just a sec. And this is called series. Double click on the canvas and type series. Uh, again, let's hover and say it needs a start point, it needs a, a step size, and it needs a count. So basically, series is um, simply I'm just going to generate a bunch of numbers. Uh, 
Uh, step size means what's the difference between the numbers? That means, let's say, uh, let's say I have a series that's called zero, two, four, and so on and so forth. So that means the step size here is two, and the step size here is two, right? Uh, if same, if I do zero, three, six, the step size is three. Right. And how many times do you want to repeat it? It's the count. So I want to repeat I here. I've repeated three times, zero to four. If I say 10 times, it'll go on till the steps. Are okay. So coming back to Rhino, it again, that means it's primarily needs numbers. So how do we give numbers? We give numbers by a slider. And I put a step size of one and I want this to go on 10 times. So I give this 10, the output, if you can just hover over S, which is a series, you'll see it, it's giving you, it's shooting out um, zero till nine. That means 10 numbers with a difference of one. So this is where we uh, wanted to begin with. Um, I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna copy series twice over just control C, control V, and just to view what's inside, again, params, panel, insert. So each of these three guys has the same information. Uh, can I request if you are not asking a question to put yourself on mute, please? Okay. Um, so you copy the panel, you feed it the information required. Currently, all of them have the same information. And let's say I want to create a point. So in your vector, in your vector tab, there is something called in your vector type and point segment, you have something called construct point at the right at the top. It shows X, Y, Z, create a point. So once you put that in, by default, the point get create, gets created at a zero, zero, zero. So if you hover at X, it has zero input, Y has zero input and Z has zero input, right? Um, again, basic uh, geometry. I think Deeksha asked uh, the importance of the point number in Cartesian grid. So this is what it is. What will happen if you think I, I pull out and put this in X, see what happens. It now charts points on the X axis. If you're familiar with Rhino, you see this little compass. This is X, that is Y and towards you, towards the screen is Z. So it is charted points in, in X direction. If I don't do this, if I disconnect and I put it in Y, it's charting points in Y direction. And you can always imagine that it's doing the same in the Z direction. I'm just, for this demonstration, I'm just gonna change my view to perspective. Okay. But what if I put X and Y both? Logic says that it should have generated a grid. But what it, it's doing is it's, this, it's plotting points on zero comma zero. It's matching data. It's matching data to a long list. So what it's doing is matching zero to zero, then one to one, two to two, three to three, and so on and so forth. So as a result, what you have on the screen is uh, again, uh, is this is zero comma zero, this is zero comma, sorry, one, comma one, this is two comma two, and so on and so forth. And this is nine, nine comma nine, right? So it's plotting all those points. It's using the long list. However, we know that we can, uh, yeah. we know we want to say create a grid. How do we do it? We want every point. So the answer is what we learned just before is cross reference. If now I put the points here 
and once I take it here, now we have the graph. So simple exercise, just to create a grid of points uh, and understanding how cross reference works. Okay. Now I want to take these points upwards as well. Uh, what I do is I zoom into a component. Uh, once, once you're away, you won't see these, but once you zoom in, you'll see the pluses and minuses. Uh, if the component has the capacity to take additional data, I just hit plus and another, uh, another segment appears. I join this here and I take it to the Z direction and there we go. We have a grid of points in the third day in 3D. Hello? Yeah. Sir, can you I can't hear you. Can you? Mm, I can't hear you still, Manali. Do you want me to repeat the last part? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so we created a 2D grid with cross reference. What was happening is if I just feed it, it will just feed it into the point. It will only create a long list. So you use a middle component, which is called cross reference, uh, as we learned in this exercise. Uh, that once you cross reference, every point's link, every point links to every point. So we created a 2D grid using that um, fundamental. However, I wanted to create another, I want to create these uh, grid of points in the third dimension as well, into the Z axis as well. So what I do is I zoom into cross reference and I add plus, and there's another uh, input uh, ready uh, segment that's created. By the way, this little thing that you zoom in and you get another input is uh, happens for for every component which can accept more data. So for example, this guy can't do it because there is no way to give more information to a point. Like three, in three uh, numbers define a point. There is no four, so it won't do it. But this takes more information. So you zoom in, you add plus, another one gets created. So you feed the, the another point list the other point and list. then and, uh, and you connect to Z. Connect to Z. Uh, uh, can I request uh, you guys to be on mute please? Yeah, thanks. So it created a 3D grid of points. Just to elaborate, these, these guys are just numbers. They don't mean, they don't know whether they are, uh, they're going to be used to create points. They're going to be used to create curves, surfaces, whatever. They don't know what they are for. However, this component, which is, which is X, Y, Z creates a point. This guy knows what to do with those numbers, right? So this is just uh, random. Uh, this is just numbers that you created unconnected, but to make sense of them by using this component. Okay. Moving on cross references is clear. I'll again zoom this a bit so that you guys just can take a look and make sure that your script is identical to this one. Yeah, all right. <sighs> okay, so I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna revisit, uh, revisit this guy again. So select this and turn this off. By the way, if you, if you, the, if you wanna group it, you can just hit control G and then you can move this magenta box together anywhere. So hit control G and you can move it, move it anywhere. I'm just going to copy this entire thing again. Control C, control V here. Uh, just remove this for now. Ready. 
these lines to be on and the three lines. Um, okay, this is where we were. And let's just change this back to 10 and this to 10 as well. And so that I'll turn these off so that you can see the point numbers. There we go. 0, 10, 0, 10. Okay. What are we going to do with this uh, information? Uh, <clears throat> what if I don't want to join them uh, in this manner? I want to join them in this manner. I want what I want to create is uh, just a second. Dropping with annotate. What I want. To, what if I want to create this way? I want to leave the alternate out. This is what I want to do. How do I use this information to create uh, that? Uh, so just so that you're at comfort, look at you can look at the script again for a bit. Okay, before that, let's try something else. Uh, let's see if we want to. Uh, okay. Okay. Right, let's let's go ahead and do that zigzag. All right. What we're gonna do is we I'm gonna introduce you to something that's called another thing that's called weave. Okay. Uh, what weave simply does is, as the name suggests, it weaves two lists, three lists, four lists, number of lists into a specific pattern. So while we understand, so the pattern we want to give it is uh, take the take the first guy and skip the second guy, uh, take the first guy of the first line and skip the first guy of the, of the second line, join it here, back and forth and repeat itself, right? So uh, take this, don't take this, take this, don't take this, and so on and so forth. And here, don't take this, take this, don't take this, take this. This is the pattern that we want to generate. Okay. Um, so, and we was going to put it together. So there's something called cull, cull pattern. And cull, it's an English word that you cull, you limit, right? It, it is asking you for a list what list to call. So you give it the point list here, control C, control V, and you give a point list from here as well. So you've got two point lists. It has the same information currently because you haven't, uh, I'll just turn, I'll just turn these points off. And if you notice what's happening is this choosing two here, two here, two here, and so on and so forth, because it has a pattern which says false, false, true, true, and it will repeat. So what is essentially doing is leave out the two points first. So false, false, true, true, false, false, true, true, and so on and so forth till you encounter the list. But what, what we want is this guy to have false, true, false, true, and this guy to have true, false, true, false. So uh, we're just going to do that. So there are two methods to do this, the same thing. You right click on the pattern, you go to set multiple booleans, and here you simply delete the middle two guys. So you have false true, commit. So you notice there how the points are now alternate. And here I'm just going to go ahead and reverse it. So I want OK. 
Okay. So I have the first list and I have a second list and I have a woven combined list. And I simply go polyline there we go. So if you realize it's skipping the middle points, skipping the middle points, it's skipping the first one it's going on. Uh, it's getting the first one of the first line starting with this and zigzag. And the moment you change the, the script will adapt. Let's just change this to 100. So, and it'll carry on as much as you want. So, I mean, this is a good way to say, let's say, create a 2D truss drawing. Okay. So, shall I, any queries here? What happened? Weave and cull. The only thing we added is these three things. Weave, cull, and feline. It's otherwise the same as the above one. What we needed was we needed to... Um, the your design decided that I don't want oops set to 10 come on for reasons your design didn't want to connect every zero to every zero or every one to every one you want to skip one so that means you have to introduce a logic how to skip and the simplest logic is that ignore accept ignore accept how rhino understands this is by true or false, a Boolean, as it, call it calls it, a false or a true. So if it's true, it will accept. If it's false, it will not. Uh, the component is called cull. Cull is trim, limit, however, it's English. I use cull component, introduce a list to it, and then give it a pattern, a true false pattern. And in the second one, you just invert the pattern. So here the pattern is false true. Here the pattern is true false. And then you weave it together. You give it list number one, list number two. It spits out uh, one list. And then you use a component called polyline. And polyline is just linking everything together. It's polyline in CAD or whatever. OK. Um, questions? Uh, sir, uh, uh, what's the use of the pattern list in the weave battery? What is the use of? Pattern list in weave battery. So su suppose you, after this, you want to introduce another pattern uh, by default, right? Once the, once the list is in, you've given, but now further you want to ignore something. So it's set to zero and one. So suppose you say, one one it does not understand because it understands you have to skip one and add the other so this is an override in a way that you can say that while you've given it a list but uh within this you want to have an override pattern so you want to give a another pattern which says okay no you've received this list but i want you to skip still skip certain elements of the list so you override it with this pattern okay thank you Okay, let's see how are we doing on schedule. Okay, um, guys, we can, if you want, we can jump into a break because uh, now we're getting, we'll probably be doing our first um, proper scripting exercise. And, uh, and that will just, you know, again, uh, with every step, the learning curve keeps on increasing. So if you want to digest, we can, just take a quick 15, 20 minute break and come back. So I have doubt. I'm not getting a cull component. Uh, just type double click and say cull pattern, man. Cull, cull pattern. Yeah. So double click on the canvas and type cull 
and this is the one you're looking for cull pattern mm, yeah all right yeah yeah thanks all right so can you explain the boolean thing again uh the boolean thing again okay sure um okay so the principle of a boolean is very simple a boolean is just a toggle it's either off or it's on right so a uh, lot of languages understand if it's zero it's off and one means it's on so i know understands it in both methods of zero and one and also understand it as a false and a true what we wanted to do here let's i'm just going to okay let's just say for the sake clear values clear values let's make two lines again i'm just going to turn grid snap i'm going to make equal lines of equal lengths okay uh select select one of and select And let's do this. So what's happening is we wanted an exercise to be done where we, where we said that we want to join the first point on this second line with the second point on the first line. We want to create this pattern, a weaving pattern. One. Here, then here, then here, like a diagonal, like a truss. Okay, that means you have to give some logic that it should skip this guy and this guy. If I want to create oh, I missed a few. Sorry. right i want to create this i want to skip i want to skip these guys right you will have to give it a logic and the simplest logic that rhino would understand is uh yes no yes no yes no right and and the other one it's the opposite no yes no yes no yes right that helps okay and now how do you feed it you feed it with a simple boolean so while yeah so now you introduce the boolean will be executed by a component called uh, cull pattern so we introduce this component called cull pattern and you feed it a predefined pattern you okay we fed it here but what you can also do is you could go to panel and you type say uh, true false right click always when you're feeding information through a panel right click and turn it into multi line data okay control c control v and you change change this the opposite false true you feed this guy this information you feed this guy this information and now the lines are like a truss okay let's play with this for a second now let's say you wanted to change a pattern what happens if you do true false false look at that it skip two points here because twice you asked into false leave it so true false false true false false true false false true what if you do this here you say false true true right now it has is forced to do false true true false true true and then because the list is over it's done understand now the pattern so this is your control over the kind of design you want to create here this could all be true there we go so you only use the first point right there is no point to write true again here is because it'll, the pattern will repeat itself true false false then it of course repeat itself again right so this is just a boolean a boolean boolean is 
take it or leave it simple okay i'm just going to set this back to Okay. Anything else? Uh, no. yeah. yeah. So uh, when we make changes in the script, we have the changes in the pattern. Is it reversibly editable? Like if we manually change in the pattern, do we have a script for future reference? Changing parallelly? What do you want to do? Just uh, here's what do you want to do? Just define. Example, if you maybe. give this pattern, yeah. if, you, if you say you feed this pattern, yeah, and something else changes, yeah, okay, okay. So say again, it totally depends on where you start on the script. Assuming this was not my end result, assuming my end result was to get points on this line, okay. What would I do? We've already learned divide curve. right so now the end result that you wanted to create was none of this bus part was this i'm just going to turn everything off and hide these curves right for some reason this is what you wanted right yeah if this is what you wanted now this result is linked or parametrically with everything behind it so now if you change the polyline the result will change so now how will we change the polyline we can change the polyline by oh, oh sorry by changing number of divisions right we can change the polyline by changing the pattern there we go so in a sense it's exactly doing that so you change the pattern to get the final result so um so it's not like it's not like we change something here and something else going to change here it designer usually works in like a uh, not in a, it's a, in a linear format in terms of that there is always an input and an output that's why you see a lot of scripts going left to right uh so usually to usually something in the forward downstream is impacted by something that's upstream it's not vice versa it does not mean that you drag it here and you say okay this is downstream this is upstream no but the information is coming from something upstream i hope that helps yeah okay thank you Oh, I don't want this guy. Uh, sir, okay. I have message you error which I am getting in the cull battery. So I sent a pic of it. So could you tell what's the error? But I can get the output though. Uh, okay. I okay. Let me see. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Okay. You left some empty. You see these empty positions in your. These are just enters. Remove these enters. Go back into the panel and delete these enters. Enters. Oh. Okay. Thank you. I got it. Okay. okay so um all right so i'm going to leave this here let's take a 15 minute break recoup because things are now getting get exciting these were just the basics just going to jump into our first script all right
So it's 143, let's say, uh, 143 India time, so 2 p.m. India time. Anyway, 17 minutes from now. This is just going to remain on. Thank you. 